graduate student, I was trying to remember what were the major subjects that made up computer science that every graduate student had to become at least somewhat fluent in. And there were exams for this. They were called the screening exams, or some people called them the screening exams. And so uh, numerical methods, that was a big thing. You had to know some numerical methods. Uh, AI was LISP, planning, robotics, and vision. And um, the big thing, uh, McCarthy would teach uh, knowledge representation. And there was a little bit of natural language processing, although it wasn't called that then. Uh, for theory, that was a big, a big area. Discrete math, algorithm design, models of computation, the complexity hierarchy. For systems, machine architecture, operating systems, databases, compiler construction, programming languages, and just the beginning of networks. Because when I was a graduate student, um, it was just beginning. Now, many of these fields still exist, but we've been reducing the time that we dedicate to many of them, especially at the undergraduate level. Uh, as an example, where do we teach operating systems now? For about two weeks in CS270. Um, Dr. Calver here, uh, is, is, is uh, disagreeing with me, but that's, that's fine. We'll have a chance to say something. We used to teach assemblers, linking and loading, memory organization, scheduling, disk organization, and more. And it would be a course of that now. But new subjects, meanwhile, have appeared. Web programming, there was no web back then. Mobile applications, there were no mobile devices. Software engineering, cryptography, which was just beginning when I was a student. Machine learning. Back then, there was only perceptrons, which were useless. And so the trends that I'm seeing where we're going forward is an increasing reliance on the part of students on pre-packaged libraries, treated as black boxes. Applications, just treated as black boxes. And less concentration on programming, the actual ability to write a program and the fundamentals that I had to learn when I was a graduate student. So that's my take on it. Now, um, Jim Grafewitt is unable to be here, but he sent me some notes, but I won't do them now. I'll just uh, uh, let other people in the panel uh, come up and say what they want to say. Who would like to go next? Who wants to rebut everything I just said? OK, so um, <laughs> I'll, I'll be in charge. Ken, would you like to uh, say something? And we've got this set up if you want to use it. It's on HDMI.
And they said, learning, in general, learning occurs by building on knowledge a person already has, which is, which is true. Uh, but I know that when, so my point is, uh, when I came up through, you know, learning introductory programming and everything, there, the world was a certain way, and I would, and all, all the development since then has built on what I learned in that time, right? And there's another quote that I saw about introductory courses, right? And uh, I really, uh, so I teach 270, and by the way, all those things that you mentioned, we do cover in 270, and it's pretty much the whole semester for most of those things. I think the difference between now and then is we just say, here's how, here's what the abstractions are. Here's the API. We don't tell you how it's implemented, whereas in operating systems, you spend more time on how it was actually being done in the, in the operating system. We talked about, today I talked about page tables, okay, and how virtual memory, virtual addresses get translated to physical addresses. But in 1980, good programmers spent a lot of time thinking they produced fair code that they thought should work. Code ran close to metal. Even Scheme, which was a functional language they used to teach introductory programming in at, at MIT. So the very first language you learned was a functional programming language. It wasn't until week four or five that you learned you could even change the value of a variable, okay? Uh, like Haskell or something. And like a resistor where if you knew the code, you could, you could see all the way down to the metal. But the rest of the code says, but programming now isn't so much like that. Nowadays, you muck around with incomprehensible or non-existent yeah. land pages for software. You don't know who wrote it. You have to do basic science on your libraries to see how they work. How many people here have done basic science experiments to find out how something in the library you're using actually behaved, right? So I used to, in the first semester I told I taught CS270, I told students all the time, I said, read the man page, read the man page, read the man page. And then I saw this quote and I went, oh yeah, the man page for, you know, something I was telling them to read, uh, I don't know, exec VE or something is, you know, eight pages long and they just can't find what they're looking for. So a little history uh, about the, what we see from the days when programmers actually programmed the thing by moving physical jumpers around, right? These are ladies who were the original programmers of ENIAC. And uh, according to Wikipedia, they developed an understanding of ENIAC's inner workings, okay? They, they figured out how to map the problem onto the, onto the hardware, which wasn't easy. And then in the 50s, there was this counting machine, and again, Again, it wasn't really a general purpose computer, it was a tabulating machine. So you, it would take this data in on punched cards, and you could program it by setting up these configuration jumpers to add certain things up, and it had these uh, relays. The, the control plane, the control logic actually was all these hundreds of electromechanical relays, and then it had these counters that were also electromechanical. So that was, that was kind of interesting. This, I learned, to program on this IBM 029 card punch. Me too. Yay. Well, I had two six. <laughs> I think it was actually 028 they had when I, when I did it. But, uh, and then we got IBM at that time had these 3270 block mode terminals. And you would, this was your program, it was a stack of cards, and you put it in a card reader and then come back later. Uh, it was still, in those days, a prank to fill someone's desk drawers with little punched out dots from the, from the computer cards, okay? You can take those from the O2 dots. I came in, actually, in the, in the 70s. This is a DEC system, uh, P, a DEC PDP-1170 mini computer. It's really this unit right here in the middle. Uh, and this one still had uh, a few years later, they took these off, but it still had the rocker switches on the front, so you could actually put in 16 bits of data to boot the thing from, okay? And an ad, a 20-bit address and 16 bits of data through the rocker switch, and it also had uh, these uh, LEDs, the red lights, that told you what the current 
address, instruction address that was executing in the 16 bits of the register, right? So you could walk by the machine or look in and you could tell if the machine was hung because the, the lights of the address were not changing. Eventually that all went away and you had to look at the terminal. And it had this uh, line printer, matrix printer. And then in the 80s, we got bitmap displays. This is the Xerox Alto. I'm sure Dr. Finkel probably, do you remember, did you get to play with those at Stanford? Only a little bit. Yeah. They were just coming in when I got there. Or they had had them, I guess, a year. It was 1979. Then this mouse was uh, from the Bell Labs, had a bitmap terminal. Then we got some workstations. Uh, of course, the internet came along, TCP IP in the early 80s. Uh, this, I, I printed my dissertation on one of these Apple laser writers the department in Texas had to be scattered throughout the, throughout the floors. Uh, the World Wide Web became a thing in the 90s. Broadband came to your home. Uh, the internet, you could get residential internet service. And then we got maybe the most influential development, of, in my opinion, of the last 30 years, uh, the App Store. Input, we have your house is filled with gadgets and internet, and we have surveillance, surveillance capital. So, the main point is when we started, like I say, you could kind of see all the way down to the hardware, right? You were, you were programming close to the machine, you kind of had to have some understanding of the whole, the whole stack, and the stack wasn't that thick. Right? Now, uh, this is your fancy interface. Uh, the whole stack fits in this tablet, but it's not just there, and, it, and it's a much taller stack of stuff. Uh, you have everything that, with the touch screen, you have the network now. Your application is not just here, it's probably in the cloud somewhere. So figuring out what's broken and why stuff doesn't work is, is, is really hard because uh, it's really hard to isolate the, the problem. So in the future, you know, the application and the system is just going to run right on your brain. And uh, there will be this direct brain interface box and you'll just think about what you want to have happen and it will happen and you won't have to, to worry about it. And there will still be bugs and they're all your fault. And they're all your fault. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. I could say some more stuff, but I'll let somebody else have to finish. Uh, data structure. 
manufactures and output is that goes into CS. I talk a little bit more about it. Cryptology, in my mind, goes into CS, into these first three bullets, which are more of theoretical nature, so more of theory. That's, that's what goes into CS, in my mind, given the definition. Then there is machine architecture, operating systems, networking, cloud computing, distributed parallel high performance computing systems, things that actually allow us to compute. Then there are things that allow us to interact with things that uh, compute, programming languages, uh, compilers. Uh, and finally, there is cybersecurity that goes into CS in my mind, because if we are about computing and about tools to support computing, we also have to support the type of computing people care about, and we care about security and privacy. Uh, and uh, I mentioned hardware and software. Computer engineering goes into computer science, as I described it. Um, and I am not an expert in computer engineering, uh, so I will not go through key elements, sub-areas there, and so on. But there is surely some aspect of hardware that goes into computer science, because things that compute, at some point, uh, there is hardware involved. This is what, uh, and perhaps some other things you could add to it. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. Uh, but a list that has some uh, uh, explanation in the definition I started with. And now, interestingly, perhaps, is uh, uh, to think about what is not CS. In my mind, AI is not CS. AI has a clear objective to build a system. I actually have a definition that, again, is my own. Uh, AI is an area of the crossroads on, uh, of many disciplines. Computer science, computer engineering, robotics, mechanical engineering, cognitive science, psychology, ethics, perhaps some others. It simply aims to create hardware software systems capable of acting based on cognition and reason. Uh, so AI is not uh, a part of CS because it's not about computation and it's not about systems that support computation. Combinatorial optimization algorithms, graph calming, traveling says per person, the flow, uh, flows in graphs, marching, spanning, none of that is in CS. None of that is really needed to understand the concept of computation. None of it is uh, really necessary to support tools uh, that people use to compute. Um, they are important for many other areas, that's why they were developed. Operations research, logistics, genetics, bioinformatics, and lots of other things. But not for computer science as such. Computer vision is not CS because it's part of AI, which is not. Numerical methods is not CS. This is something that comes to mathematics, but more importantly than them, to physics, to health sciences in general, and to engineering. They cannot do things without numerical methods. They care about numerical methods, not computer scientists. Uh, it's engineers and scientists that, have, uh, that care about numerical methods. Sorry. Yeah. Sure, sure. When I get going, it's hard to interact with, but I like it. But I like when people interact with. I have to say that numerical methods is not about computation. Okay. Uh, so we can. Uh, uh, we can discuss that, but maybe there will be even more things to discuss. So let's keep, this, uh, let's keep this point in mind. You know, I didn't come here to give you truths that cannot be disputed, okay? This is not the tables that I received from somebody, okay? This is just my uh, naive, perhaps, uh, and simplistic point of view. Um, and I have this tendency of oversimplifying, by the way, which I'm aware of. Uh, data science is not CS because the focus in data science is on data, not on computation, but on data. Uh, okay, now I didn't speak about databases, graphics, software engineering. Well, these are sort of gray areas in my mind. Uh, it's not quite clear where right they belong. Databases could belong as programming languages uh, to CS because they facilitate access, interaction, human interaction with computer systems, but more importantly, they are means to program, to program some computations that uh, are necessary to query data. Uh, yeah, uh, software engineering for a different reason, perhaps, is, in my opinion, a gray area, perhaps not entirely in CS, but not necessarily outside CS. All right. 
having said all that, uh, yeah, what? Yeah. Where do you put human-computer interaction? Uh, Human-computer interaction is in CS, and uh, if it's not in my list, it is simply because at some point it disappeared. But human-computer interaction is in CS. Um, uh, so teaching. Uh, when you think about what is CS, um, then of course today teaching what is CS, what I put in CS is not enough. Not all students want only this and just this. Not, not all students will need it. But they do need a lot of things that I classify as non-CS because that's where the jobs are. People are asking about these things and they better know uh, that. So the bottom line for me as far as teaching is concerned, we must teach a broadly defined computing curriculum, including CS, but also including obviously AI, uh, AI machine learning, data science, software engineering, computer engineering. We have to have that in our computer science curriculum. Uh, in fact, that's what's happened. We do have lots of these things in our computer, uh, curriculum. They are not part of CS, as it was perhaps understood early on and as I defined it here, but they are necessary for a computer science curriculum. So here are the takeaways. Uh, much of research done in CS departments, not CS. Much of education done in CS departments, not computer science. We have to acknowledge that. Once we acknowledge that, we will realize that CS departments must work into something broader. Computer, computing, software, data, and intelligent system departments, schools, colleges. All right, that's it for you. Well, thank you. That's a uh, I've often thought that the name computer science is a misnomer, that it should be called algorithmics. But you have a different name to put it. You wouldn't call it algorithmics. No. You would call it computation. Yes. Taking a cue from the all right, well, now we'll hear Dr. Dietz, who will have his take on it. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, Dr. Dietz is in the um, electrical engineering department, but he's essentially a computer scientist, according to my definition. According to my PhD, actually. Yes, I'm going to my definition, too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to start by trying to cause a little bit controversy here, although I think that may have already been done by the previous talk. Uh, so well, let me just start by saying, you know, when, when I first uh, started, I didn't really know what universities were about and all that because I was the first one in my family to go to college. So we made a real point of taking a look at a lot of different universities and seeing what kinds of programs they had. And uh, I actually went to 30 different universities before I applied around. And then, you know, it's a long story, but I started out at Columbia University. I was there for two years. And then I moved in large part because the thing that they had for CS I didn't like. And I moved to a different place for, for that, which is now actually NYU. And so, at any rate, this was what I, I, I noticed as I was going around from school to school. Uh, so you saw a very wide discrepancy in terms of what was thought to be computer science-y stuff. And uh, it really depended on where the program came from. <laughs> So you had a lot of schools where it came from the math side, and they tend to be very focused on algorithms, very heavily on theory. Uh, things like concrete math were, were very fundamental. They didn't really care so much about programming. Uh, they were happy to see people programming in, in basic, COBOL, LISP, almost anything. But it was really more about the algorithms and the design of computation in general, the kind of thing that, that they were hearing from there. Uh, it wasn't really something where they were focused on programming, per se. Uh, and in fact, I, I will say there were a lot of them that literally the majority of faculty did not use computers, which was kind of a surprise to me. Uh, electrical engineering spawned ones, which were a little bit rarer than that. Uh, basically, kind of what you'd expect. Electrical engineering, they tended to be heavy on the circuits and the digital design. But perhaps it's a little bit surprising that there was a lot of programming language stuff in there as well. Uh, I think uh, compilers kind of smells a lot like hardware design in a lot of ways. So that kind of, kind of tended to creep in a lot. Uh, programming, believe it or not, the main, main thing that they focused on was assembly language. And yes, you had some higher level language stuff in Fortran, PL1, and then a little bit later C definitely became very dominant. But if you think about 
about it, the, the PL1 and C stuff, it was, C was kind of close to the metal, so that made a lot of sense. And PL1 was kind of saying, well, what is it that people might want to do with our hardware, right? So it was kind of trying to cover the, the full range of what people might want to think about a computer system doing. Then the one that's even more surprising to a lot of people is that there are actually quite a few programs that were started in physics. And the thing that's weird about that is, is not so much that there are these programs started in physics, because we all know early computers were used for an awful lot of physics, right? But uh, the thing that's really weird is there's a lot of operating system stuff. Basically, real-time operating system stuff really started out as telescope control and fire control systems. And so there's a surprising amount of that emphasis in the programs that I saw that were based on physics. Uh, you can usually spot those because those are the ones where they require you to learn APL or something like that as the programming language. Now, this is kind of how things, I think, started out. But obviously, none of these is really computer engineering. These are just little offshoots from these different pieces. So at some point, computer science and computer engineering and so forth had to get synthesized from this. Now, my PhD says computer science, but it was granted by an EE department. Right, it's the CS, CS division of an EE department. Now let me just say, yeah, actually before I go back, uh, go into that, let me just mention. So at Columbia University, there was a math-based one, there was a physics-based one, and electrical engineering so computer science was basically in its infancy when I was there. And, and in some sense, that was the one I leaned towards, so that's part of why I didn't actually end up staying there. So NYU, well, or back then, the piece of it is NYU 10 and now, used to be Brooklyn Poly when I was there. Brooklyn Poly, they basically had electrical engineering squad one that was a better fit for me. Okay, so what courses did I take when I was doing my graduate degree there? Well, basically, I took a lot. And you take a look at them and you'll notice that most of them are sequences. Data structures and algorithms, I think we'd all agree that that sounds like CS core material. Compilers 1 and Compilers 2, that to me is an absolutely fundamental computer science material, but it's not something that actually is emphasized in any of the current documents. Uh, if you take a look, uh, the requirement for uh, a, a, a compiler course was actually dropped from ABA and, uh, for computer engineering a while back. Uh, there are a lot of things that have basically just kind of made that go away. Uh, operating systems 1 and 2. Operating systems, again, to me, very critical piece of, of what you need is system support software. And I'm kind of surprised to say that it's kind of been lightened down too. Uh, 270 is doing a pretty good job of it, but let's face it, it used to be more course than that, right? Uh, it used to be more credits than, than just what you get in 270. Uh, switching on automata theory. Yeah, we do a lot of theory stuff. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not gonna say anything more about that, but it wasn't my favorite thing. Uh, computer architecture, okay, sure. That sounds kind of like it's a computer engineering thing, but let me just say, if you look at the, the standard curriculum, which I'll show you in a moment, computer engineering and computer science are both supposed to have a pretty fair amount of computer architecture still. Right. Software engineering was a big thing. Uh, artificial intelligence had a uh, sequence. I, I missed the second half of the sequence, what can I say? Couldn't take everything, right? Uh, programming languages was a big thing. Parallel processing was just getting started, and everyone expected that we were going to have parallel processing be the norm. That by now, actually, not by now, by 20 years ago, we figured everyone was going to be learning to write parallel programs in their first programming class. That's never happened. Kind of disturbing. Uh, what's even more disturbing is that parallel processing is now the way that you get speed up on modern computers. So, kind of weird that we don't have people explicitly learning about that early in the curriculum. Fault tolerant computing was a big thing, computer graphics, queuing systems, again, some more theory. And then I had to take German 1 and 2. <laughs> and I'm, I bring this up because it's actually significant. So undergrad, I had to take things like, for example, thermodynamics. We don't do that anymore. Uh, thermodynamics and a handful of other things were considered basic material that everyone in a science or engineering field would need to know a little bit about just so that they could do things like handle cooling systems for the electronics and, and what have you. And those requirements basically have kind of gone away. So we're, we're kind of losing breath at the lower levels and, and gaining it perhaps at these very high levels, these very abstract levels. Uh, 
the German 1 and 2, basically the reason I took that was because they required you to translate uh, some technical passage uh, written in a different language in order for you to, to qualify for the PhD. So, uh, German. Uh, so, just to say a little bit about how things have, have evolved since then. Basically, this is a, a little uh, diagram from, as you can see, the, uh, the computing curriculum specification from 2005. And it's a little hard to read here, but this is talking about organizational system issues, application technologies, software development, systems infrastructure, computer hardware and architecture, and then basically going from theory to application deployment. So they're saying essentially, you know, in, in the IEEE and ACM guidelines, they're saying basically computer science is kind of the theory and development and not really getting too low on the hardware and not really getting too high on the organizational system issues. And I'm not sure I agree with that, uh, but uh, basically that's, that's the way that things have been leaning for the last decade plus. Here's a little overview of the other CS-ish things, right? And you can see the uh, computer engineering, basically, they have us covering all of the stuff that's near the hardware. All the low-level things, low-level well, hardware, software, all that, but basically almost nothing to do with applications, right? Uh, if we take a look at information systems, it's basically almost entirely applications and weighted towards the actual installation and use of them. Uh, so not really talking about developing them so much. Uh, information technology, again, up in that other corner, right? It's basically saying uh, focus is on uh, actually yeah, implementing these things and not so much creating new stuff, etc. just using the things as systems. And then software engineering, you can see, is kind of this blob in the middle, which I'm not sure I agree with either, but I agree. <laughs> so this is the sort of uh, feeling that, that we're seeing evidence in curricula right now. And there are all sorts of little outlines of what we're supposed to have there. This was from back in 2013. And I, I think a lot of these are topics that I'm kind of surprised to see here because I don't think that we see them as heavily in most curricula as we see them in the listing here. Uh, for example, you do see parallel distributed computing is a fairly big emphasis here, but it's not something that most programs actually put much emphasis on. Uh, if we take a look at the newer one, which is, of course, bigger and therefore better, right? Uh, basically, the main thing to really note about this is that the, the titles of these sections are kind of interesting. So you've got your users and organizations, systems modeling, systems architecture and infrastructure, software development, software fundamentals, and hardware. Uh, to put it very bluntly, uh, these these top two are not really things we worried about when I was doing this. Uh, there's a lot more abstraction here. There's a lot more looking at complex systems as, as Rafi said, black boxes than I'm used to. So let me just kind of summarize what I think has really been going on and where I think we're headed. And, and again, you know, computer engineering, computer science, I think we're very close. It doesn't really matter which label we put on those two. Uh, What's really happened is, back when I learned about this stuff, you could actually, in, say, a year's time, come to understand, literally, what every last circuit component inside of a simple computer did. And if you made something like, for example, a little program that ran on a computer and made a light flash, that was a cool thing. That was something that, you know, people would probably be talking about for days. That is not the case now. The ante for having something be cool is huge. And the amount of complexity involved in making something that's cool is even more huge. And I think that's really cost us this, this fundamental understanding of, of how to do things efficiently, how to do things in ways that make good sense, and, and how to develop new algorithms to some extent. But what we've been gaining is this idea of how people deal with black boxes. Uh, you know, how, do you actually, how do you actually handle putting together software where you didn't really write any of the pieces that you're putting together. Uh, personally, I think that that's a good direction to keep going. I think we need that. But I think that at some level, we need to get people back to the fundamentals. Because at some point, somebody's going to have to be building the next modules that are the low-level modules that deal with these new things. And we're not really building up that kind of knowledge in our student population. I think we've, we've skewed to the point where, for example, by leaving out compilers and operating systems, uh, and, and we're even doing this in architecture. We don't talk so much about building processors from scratch now. It's more like, well, you're probably going to be adding on a little module to an ARM processor or something like that. Right? So that's all good, but 
I think we still need to get that fundamental core a little bit more strengthened so that we can keep developing, you know, fundamentally new things and, and be able to actually have a broader range of devices and, and kinds of applications that we can support rather than just saying, well, I guess we've got all the modules that we need, all the compiler stuff that we need is already done, all the operating systems are, well, just run Linux, and uh, you know, all the hardware that you need is made by Intel anyway, so who cares, right? Uh, so that's, that's my feeling. We need to get back to having at least a little bit of that focus on the fundamentals and that joy in being able to put together a simple system where you can understand everything about it and it still does something. To uh, illustrate what Dr. Deeds is saying about uh, you can understand what everything was. This is the Digital Equipment Corporation uh, microcomputer processors. Oh, you brought that from 1998. Okay, it's for the LSI 11. Uh, and it's got the whole instruction set, it's got the instruction timings, it's got everything. Now, you know how big the, I, the x86 64 programmer's manual is? today from Intel. I think it's like five volumes. It's probably 4,000 pages or something, right? right? And it's not telling you at the gate level. <laughs> no. It's not telling you instruction timings because those are undefined. <laughs> you know, the answer right. is independent, right? <laughs> right. Right. And so let me just uh, show you now what uh, Jim Griffith had to say. And primarily, what he says is that the fundamentals, um, the amount of and the complexity of what you need to know in the fundamentals has been growing. And maybe that's why we don't concentrate on the fundamentals anymore. But he gives some examples. Our operating systems, which we've all talked about. Um, in the past, um, you could describe critical parts of an operating system, including all the code, in a textbook. And you can cover it in a single course. And uh, Jim Griffith took the, uh, the, the course with uh, Comer, and they used the Xenu book. I took the course, actually, when I was taking operating systems as a graduate student, I took it three times, because there were three different people teaching it. And each had a very different attitude and approach to it. So I saw it in many ways. Well, you, you should also take credit for having written it, though, so it's That happened later, yeah. Uh, but, and so things, the textbook has Processes, context switching, system calls, memory management, semaphores, locks, devices, and basic file systems. And you can learn it all in a semester. I've actually taught the internals of Linux, and we do teach a little bit of all of that, but it's much more complicated in Linux than it was in Xenu. But now there's a long list of critical components of an operating system which won't work unless you have these. Even a laptop is extremely complicated. Now you've got to be able to have support for multi-CPU core threading, GPUs, uh, graphical processing units, message passing between processes, virtual memory, a long list of complex file systems, user authentication and such. And then there are window managers. And that's integrated these days into operating systems, although less in Linux than in uh, Microsoft, uh, but it's a critical part of mobile devices. Um, networked and distributed and cluster features are very common and critical these days. There is a long list of critical services that must be running on the operating system in order for it to work. If you just look at a process list on an idle Linux machine, it's got a hundred processes there. Uh, and Mac OS is based actually on you. That's cool. <laughs> uh, cross architecture support, ranging from embedded devices and mobile phones and tablets and laptops and desktops and servers, even though they're all Intel. Well, they aren't all Intel. Not if you go through that whole list. And so to understand operating systems nowadays, you either have to take a broad approach and just give a high level description of all those little pieces, like what I just did or you have to teach a whole series of courses. And we end up watering things down, like scheduling, memory management, virtual memory. How much time does 270 have to teach on memory management? One day, you said. Maybe you spend two days on it. 
when I was teaching operating systems, memory management was a, a several weeks. And uh, we would start with segmentation, then we go into paging, then we go on to multi-level anyway. Right. How about databases? Well, in the past, the critical concepts were relational databases and the SQL language. You can cover that in one course. Now, you've got to also include graph-oriented databases, columnar databases, key-value databases, like IndexedDB, which I'm teaching right now in web, in web programming, document databases, time series databases. And there are whole database management systems with a wide range of complex front-end portals and graphical interfaces. And then how do you collect the data to populate the database? That's become very complicated. Various types of things for streaming data collection, log collection, metric collection. A lot of people do research, in fact, in this department, looking at Twitter feeds. Well, how do you turn that into something which you put in a database? Or um, uh, uh, Dr. Sadiq is looking at um, App Store, Google App Store, and what people have said about various apps, collecting that to put into a database to do some analysis. So to understand databases nowadays, again, you, you can use a broad brush approach and give a high level description, or you have to teach a whole bunch of courses. How many courses do we currently teach in databases? One, if you're lucky. At the undergraduate level, 405, at the graduate level, four, five or five, but it's the same course you could take it under either number. One course, and there might be specialty courses occasionally. All right, another thing, which I wouldn't have even thought about, high-performance supercomputers. Well, that used to be just the domain of physics. People needing a lot of compute cycles. If you want to do quantum electrodynamics, you've got to have a supercomputer. You've got to do Luckily, it's, it's uh, up, often the computations are trivially parallel, and so you just start up a bunch of them. And there was just a small group of supercomputer users. But now, there's big data. Almost everyone needs help analyzing the data, needs to run on a supercomputer class computing infrastructure. And so we now need to develop algorithms and solutions to make effective use of supercomputer class cyber infrastructure like HCP centers, HPC, or is it HCP? It doesn't bother us more. High performance computing, yeah. We have such a center here on campus. How many of you have ever used any of the on-campus facilities outside the department? All right, and I have as well. In fact, right now I'm running on a machine that's got about 250 cores looking for a needle in a haystack, and we're not even sure if the needle is even there. If we find the needle in that haystack, that's worth the publication. If we don't, well, there was a lot of electrons that were seriously inconvenienced. But it's still better than Bitcoin. Still better than Bitcoin, yeah. All right, um, so techniques developed by high-performance computing is now of great interest to computer scientists. Less interest in the past, more now. Uh, and a lot of the problems that are being solved now are solved by domains outside, of, are, are needed for domains outside of computer science. Um, uh, for, you can't have a, a one-size-fits-all solution to uh, all the domains. Uh, genomics has its own questions and its own answers. Everyone these days is saying, I've got a hammer, I'm gonna look at everything as a nail, and my hammer is machine learning. How many of you have taken a course or taught a course in machine learning? I'm surprised at how few of you, because if you look at the specialties of almost all of the candidates for new faculty that we brought in, and we brought in or listened on Zoom to about 10 of them, I thought about eight of them were in machine learning one way or another. And so anyway, Dr. Griffin says this leads to becoming computer science, becoming computer science plus some application area. Well, we've all spoken now. Um, responses, people who want, we can talk about them ourselves and say, I think you were right, I think you were wrong. Um, any suggestions?
suggestions or comments from people in the field or students learning this material right now? Okay. Yeah. So that like a traditional mathematics course, topology is considered one of the cores, but you don't see a lot of people going into like research in topology because it's so well established. Are some of these things that you guys are modern on so well established that it'd be hard to even get publications? Yeah, there is that. But the question is, um, compilers, for example, is there new research being done in compiler construction? Could I investigate compiler construction and get a paper? Well, Dr. Dietz has done that. But I <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, let's put it this way. I can tell you that a few years ago, we had a lovely panel at the you know, language of compiler and general computing workshop on exactly that topic. Basically, you know, are we done yet? And unfortunately, yeah. the answer was no, we're not done yet. On the other hand, everyone was kind of like, yeah, but we're kind of reaching the point of diminishing returns on what we said. Yeah, when I was a so student. So it's, it's requiring looking at some kind of weird variants of it. When I was a student, there were a great number of possible parsing methods. Uh, and the one I learned in compiler construction isn't used at all anymore. These days, you only really need to know a few. Uh, you don't need to know any unless you're building a compiler. And you're building a compiler, use a compiler generator, and it's going to give you LAL out of parsing. And if you really want to build top-down parsing by hand, you can do that easily, and I've done that. But OK, parsing theory is not a big deal anymore. Yeah. So Dr. Fay and I were talking about this at once the other day. When we came, when I came in 1998, and he came a couple years later, everybody, every department was hiring people on networking. And networking was a big deal because the internet was exploding. Well, networking is now, there, there's basically two areas where networking, if you look at the many conferences, there still exist, maybe three areas. One is edge computing and learning at the edge, so you don't have to shoot up your models back and forth all the way to the data center. Uh, data center networking, because that's what makes the cloud run, and that's what the companies are interested in. So we're all trying to, all the researchers in the are trying to solve Microsoft's and Amazon's problems, which I don't understand why they want to do that. <laughs> but, um, and security. Uh, we still have grossly insecure inter-domain routing system, which nobody has, well, we know how to fix it, but how to send people to fix it is, is an open question. And I'm thinking there used to be uh, conferences in many computers. Yeah. And that disappeared when people said, well, you know, there's nothing you can do on a mini computer you can't do on any computer. It's not really special. Right. The attack of the killer microbes, but no survivors. <laughs> Right, and so yeah, there are some areas where we still need to teach, but it's, the material is fairly well known. Is new research being done on finite state automata? Oh. Yeah, most likely not. However, it's still an important area if you want to consider it as a tool for building such things as regular expression uh, uh, software. Who uses regular expression software? Everyone. And it's, it's deeply embedded in uh, JavaScript, in Perl, in Python. They all have it. So now the interesting question is, do they all have it by calling the same library of keys? <laughs> the ones that were developed for Perl. Yeah, I suspect the answer is yes for a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. But that's dangerous. Because okay. let's say you want to change that a little bit, or, or let's say that know that in JavaScript, if you search for characters, you only get ASCII. You have to say something special if you want to have a regular expression that deals with uh, Unicode. And how long has Unicode been around? At least 20 years now. But some things, yes, are fixed, but we still have to teach them. Yeah? I think this is a 